Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this special Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar, sponsored by Clinical Omics Magazine, a digital publication of GEN focused on molecular diagnostics and precision medicine. Our presentation today is entitled, Liquid Biopsy Thrusts Non-Invasive Molecular Diagnostics into the Clinical Arena. I'm Jeff Bogaliskis, Technical Editor for GEN, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar presentation. The phrase liquid biopsy has set the molecular diagnostic field ablaze with the promise of rapid disease detection using a host of non-invasive techniques. Researchers are constantly on the hunt for novel methods to capture circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA in order to improve detection sensitivity and specificity. In this webinar, we will discuss how liquid biopsies are shaping the diagnostic landscape and how these changes will impact clinical decision making and patient care. Our panelists are excited to describe their cutting edge research and reveal their latest discoveries, which could significantly impact the liquid biopsy field and provide insight into disease initiation and progression. Let's meet our panelists for this webinar who will discuss advances within the liquid biopsy field and how their current work is seeking to push the technology even further. Our first speaker today will be John Martinetti, Associate Professor of Genetics and Genomic Sciences at Mount Sinai Hospital. Dr. Martinetti will tell us about his laboratory's work on detecting circulating tumor DNA and gynecological cancers and the potential impact on patient care. Our second presentation today will be given by David Wong, Associate Dean for Research at the UCLA School of Dentistry. Dr. Wong will inform us about his current research concerning the use of salivary samples for disease identification and wellness monitoring. Before our speakers get started, I want to encourage the audience to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We will try and answer as many questions as we can, so simply type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom left-hand side of the presentation screen and hit submit. Now let's get our, present, our webinar underway and open the floor to our first speaker. Dr. Martinetti? Great, Jeff. Thanks very much for the introduction. Today I want to address our interest in use of circulating tumor DNA in gynecologic cancers within our translational research laboratory, which is part of the Mount Sinai community. And we've really been using this to address outstanding problems as we see them in clinical care of women with these cancers and really trying to develop these tools for future clinical care. So I've really tried to encapsulate the problem, the clinical problem that we have in ovarian cancer and taking care and treating women with this disease. And really epithelial ovarian cancer remains the leading cause of death from gynecologic malignancies in the U.S. and worldwide. There will be an estimated 22,000 new cases of this cancer in 2016 with about 14,000 deaths in the U.S. alone. And so the high mortality to morbidity ratio is really something that's striking in this disease. And more than 70% of newly diagnosed ovarian cancer cases present as advanced stage disease. And what I'd like to talk about in the rest of the uh, upcoming slides is, again, really thinking about the clinical problem and how ctDNA can address a number of these unmet needs. And so the problem has been that the five-year survival rates in ovarian cancer, while other cancers have improved dramatically over the past several decades, that has not been the case for ovarian cancer. Indeed, whereas most cases of ovarian cancer, the survival has gone up, those patients, again, the majority of patients with high-grade disease, really have not seen these benefits. And to put this into perspective, what I'd like to show is kind of the natural history of the disease. And so on this slide, what I have is really what the patient and the physician see. So someone will present with symptoms, a diagnosis will be made, and no matter where you are in the world, you will be treated by surgery and chemotherapy. And the combination chemotherapy everyone gets is platinum and taxol. Following this, there's a period of time where the disease may progress, may not progress. And I say it in that way because, again, there is no way to determine who will progress and who won't. And so you have a series of patients who are living with their disease. And the problem really becomes, and in this slide I've tried to highlight that, the problem really becomes that as you look at 
sections as we've looked at for the past 50, 60 years or more of a patient with ovarian cancer. Let's say you've got patients, three different patients, all with the same stage of disease. We know that patients will have different survivals, but we can't distinguish who will have a better outcome and who won't. And so you can talk about this in terms of platinum sensitivity, platinum resistance, chronic disease, recurrent disease. And really our entry into this study um, with liquid biopsy really comes down to the fact, as I've highlighted on the right side of the screen, that currently there are no clinically useful tools to predict outcome. And surveillance protocols, once a patient's been treatment, really remain controversial. And another way of thinking about this is, again, if you look at the timeline of a patient, I've highlighted that at following surgery and chemotherapy, there really are no prognostic biomarkers available. And again, for surveillance, which again, all patients will undergo, the use of CA-125 imaging modalities, be it CT or PET scanning and clinical exam, really are controversial. Um, they have their benefits, they have their negatives, they are costly, and none of them have really been shown to increase overall survival. And if anything, one could even argue that they may negatively affect quality of life. So with this background, what we've tried to do here within our division, the um, Division of Gynecologic Oncology with Peter Dettino and myself and at Mount Sinai, is really try to approach the problem in a different way and see if we can identify more sensitive and specific biomarkers that may be able to help this problem. And so what I've shown in this slide is really the pipeline that we've established here at Mount Sinai from the center picture of the moment a patient comes into the OR, the laboratory is notified, and we have a system in place now where tumor sample, patient history, all the relevant information shown on this slide, and follow-through in a HIPAA-compliant, IRB-compliant manner is established for that patient. So, for example, a piece of tumor will come up to the laboratory. It will go through an integrated sequencing program here in our personalized cancer therapy program. Cell lines will be established on the patient. Blood and tumor DNA will be established. And we've established this pipeline really to follow the patient longitudinally. So in other words, it's not just that the patient has a tumor sample donated to the laboratory for research purposes, but we're really trying to establish a way that once the patient makes contact with um, the hospital, we follow these patients longitudinally throughout their care. And here's now where the liquid biopsy has really come into play. And so I have a couple of slides just really to highlight the history. And it's interesting to think about the, um, I guess, really the, the timing of some of these discoveries. And so in 1947, the existence of circulating free DNA was established. And if you think about that historically, that's just several years after the identification of DNA as the transforming principle, and it's just a couple years before the identification of the double helix. And it was 30 years after that initial discovery that cancer patients were found to have increased levels of circulating tumor DNA. But really, probably one of the linchpin studies were really done in the 90s when it was realized that tumor cells releasing their DNA into the circulation harbor uh, the DNA that's released actually harbors the same mutations as present in the circulating tumor DNA. Um, and so the, the idea then becomes if you can search through the bloodstream knowing that normal cells, inflamed cells, cancer cells are releasing nucleic acids, releasing tumor cells or releasing normal cells into the bloodstream, if you can not only isolate them and detect them, you actually have a way of following a patient's tumor status through a liquid biopsy. And what I want to highlight is actually some of our examples here that we've really been using in gynecologic oncology to develop a personalized ovarian cancer uh, program. And so what I have here is actually the experience with one patient in particular, which we had done this study several years ago, where again, is the pipeline that I've spoken about is we have tumor acquisition, 
the samples come up to the laboratory, the samples are sequenced either using whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and in that time, several years ago, we were actually looking for fusion sequences in a patient's tumor. And that allowed us to make highly specific um, biomarkers or probes for tumor DNA in the bloodstream. And in particular, I want to highlight the case of patient 87. So this is one of the patients who originally had surgery performed in November 2009. And as you can see from the graph, her uh, biomarker then, which really is, again, the only biomarker that, that's routinely used, CA125, was elevated, but not dramatically so. And what you can see is I've established a red line across showing elevated levels. Anything above that red line would be considered abnormal, below within normal limits. And we've also highlighted the patient's clinical course. Everything shown in yellow, the horizontal, I'm sorry, the vertical bars in yellow would be any surgical interventions. And anything in purple or lavender would be the chemotherapeutic agents that she received. So you can see that over this four-year period from 2009 to 2013, she's had a number of recurrences, but dramatically in the 28 CA125 levels that were drawn, only three of them were actually considered in an abnormal level. But if you then looked at the fusion that we identified, and so for patient 87, we had actually identified an FGFR2 fusion. If you look at the bottom of the graph that's shown, what you can see is that each of the blood samples that we had been storing on this patient over this four-year course, so any time a patient would come in to have a CA125 level drawn, half of that sample would actually be brought to the laboratory and stored. So the same sample that was used for CA125 was also used for ctDNA collection and analysis. And what you can see is that every one of those 28 samples over that four-year period demonstrated the presence of tumor because the fusion was identified in the bloodstream. And so in this individual, just as could be really expected from looking at the clinical course, ctDNA is really shown to outperform CA125, and it detects occult disease. The other power of ctDNA, for example, in this patient, knowing that she has an FGFR fusion, one could actually monitor in her blood for the presence of the fusion and potentially provide an FGFR inhibitor. And in this example, what we had demonstrated was, because we've actually established cell lines in all of our patients, we could take cell lines from this individual who we know have the, has the fusion, compare it to several other patients who do not have the fusion, and use a number of drugs to see whether or not her cells respond specifically. And as shown in this slide, they do respond to the inhibitor. So, the more modified pipeline, and the one that we're using now again, is tumor acquisition occurs as always, and then we have a period of, or uh, I guess this pipeline of integrated molecular analysis, and this really can take a number of different, you know, um, faces. So what I've highlighted here is that we can look for point mutations now using either RNA-seq, whole exome sequencing. We can use panels. For example, uh, in a recent study, we used the ion amplice cancer hotspot panel. We can do PacBio long, long read sequencing. And indeed, we've actually even developed our own Mount Sinai gynecologic cancer panels for ovarian and endometrial cancers. And the idea is really to identify tumor-specific biomarkers for finding the tumor DNA. Again, in this pipeline, we are dependent upon knowing the original tumor sequence. In next iterations, we hope to be able to bypass that and go directly to the blood. And so then you can see collection of blood samples from all our patients throughout the natural history of their disease, and then the analysis. And what we've been using currently is a droplet digital PCR for the analysis. And so here's another way of viewing the pipeline. Again, patient enrollment, uh, sequencing of the tumor, we define probe specificity for the probes being defined for droplet digital PCR, we extract circulating DNA from patient serums, and then we test the patient's circulating DNA by digital PCR, and then we can compare the CT DNA results to CA125, CT imaging, surgery findings, and even survival status. And so given that ability, what I'd really like to describe, <clears throat> excuse me, is a recent study that was just published last week. And what we were able to do was now compare ctDNA to CA125 and CT imaging. 
and show is, is, is um, shown in the slide, the study design is, is just shown here, where we had identified 44 patients with gynecologic cancer, where we had CT imaging results, CA125 results. We had multiple blood samples on each of the patients. We divided those patients up into those who had ovarian cancer and even uterine cancer. And then we could follow them and compare at each of these points the essentially the findings between CA125, CT imaging, and CT DNA. And so we had a total of 228 CT DNA samples from 32 patients who were ultimately analyzed. And what I'd like to show you are some of the results. In particular, when we compared CT DNA to CA125 and the CT scan, what was interesting when we looked at sensitivity and specificity, what really struck out and kind of surprised me or surprised us was that we really were not doing seemingly very well in specificity when we compared CT DNA against uh, imaging or CT scans. And indeed, you can see I've circled it in red that the specificity was really about 0.6. And what was interesting to us was why did it seemingly look so bad when, again, the potential was so great? Well, what we did was we actually went back to each of those patient charts, and what we could show was in each of the six patients where we seemingly had really um, failed against CT scanning was that CT scanning detected no disease, but indeed follow-up surgery on those patients within several months showed that the disease was actually present. So what we were showing was that CT DNA was actually more sensitive than scanning. And indeed, when we looked at those patients, we could actually detect recurrence of disease about seven months earlier than CT scanning. And here's an example uh, that I provided, patient 137, where we can compare in, in patient's timeline again here. So if you look at the bottom part on the x-axis, it's the months post-surgery. The uh, y-axis are either CA125 levels or CT DNA levels. And again, in yellow is shown CT PET scanning, and yellow is also shown surgery in this instance. And what you can see is that on the very bottom, the stippled uh, graph shows CA125 levels were pretty much always normal up until about a month before this patient had surgery for bowel resection because of recurrence of her disease. If you look at the CT PET scan, which was done several months before the surgery, that PET scan had been reported as negative. But if you actually look almost about seven, eight months earlier to that surgery, you can see that CT DNA was actually detectable. And not only was it detectable several months before, but it actually seven months before, sorry, um, what you can see is that that level was rising. And so had we been able to follow the CT DNA on this individual, we might have been able to actually get into the OR seven months earlier. Now, that brings up another point. And really, can we predict differences in survival based on CT DNA levels following treatment? Again, as I showed you that natural history timeline, I've highlighted here in green, you know, again, one of the conserved points in every patient's um, treatment history. Again, the time of surgery and chemotherapy. And so we ask the question, can we somehow distinguish survival at the time of completion of a patient's chemotherapy. If you think back to one of the slides where I showed the three pathology slides showing three different patients all had different outcome, can we somehow distinguish between them? And so what we did was we actually took the CT DNA levels and actually a small number of patients, it was about 10 patients that we looked at. We just asked the question, a binary question, is CT DNA detectable following primary chemotherapy or not. And as I show you in these Kaplan-Meier curves, what you can see is patients that had no CT DNA detectable had both progression improved, progression-free, and overall survival, and pretty dramatically so. Now, the final thing that I'd like to leave, just I guess kind of a trip from uh, bench to bedside, is the potential, I guess, of what will the future hold for CT DNA use in gynecologic cancers? And so here I've actually shown a patient 2-8, her 
natural history of the disease. And again, you can see a patient actually came into the OR in 2012, and the chart goes through December 2015. Again, yellow would be any surgical events. Lavender or purple would be all the chemotherapies that she's received. And again, you can see the CA125 um, that were measured. What you can see is that really at the end of three years, the patient had had multiple recurrences, multiple surgeries, and many, many different trials of chemotherapy. And you can see that actually December, that really the, the disease seemed to be spiraling out of control you know, just based on the CA125 levels. Now, again, one of the strengths of our program is that because we've established cell lines on these patients, we can actually take a series of drugs, test them against the cell lines. We can actually even test those drugs against some of the PDX mice that we've established. And for this one patient, we actually had a number of kind of um, ideas or clues that she may be responsive to a particular drug. And what I'm showing you here is actually her response profile compared against about 25 or so other patient cell lines. And you can see that she's actually quite sensitive to this drug that we're testing here, as was the PDX mice that was compared, um, uh, that was tested using this drug. And so what we asked was, well, could this patient be a potential candidate and could ctDNA potentially be helpful in a clinical trial um, scenario. And indeed, we requested the ability to treat this patient from the FDA. The FDA approved it rather quickly, given the data that we have and the patient's clinical course. And what I want to highlight here is really th this last period. And so if you look at her CA125 levels, and you follow that along and just cross over the dosing regimen that she received, you can see that she gotten two doses first, second two doses, and then at the very top of that, I have a little golden arrow there, and 24 hours before her next dose, you can see the CA125 CA levels were still rising. Indeed, they were the, probably some of the highest to that point for her. And so she, the patient, and the family, and the treating physicians really questioned the value of this experimental agent. Again, it looked great in the laboratory, it looked great on a cell line, it looked great in a mouse, but seemingly it wasn't helping the patient. So before that next dose, we actually, and, and, and as it turns out, this was actually Christmas Eve, we actually took a blood sample, ran over to the laboratory, isolated the DNA, tested it, and what you can see there, if you look on the red bar where her CT DNA had started to rise initially, but if you actually look at the red graph, you can see that her CT DNA levels were actually falling. So the patient actually took the next dose of the medicine again, wanted to see what would happen, and indeed the follow-up CA125 and the follow-up CT DNA levels actually fell. For a number of reasons, the patient had to stop the drug, and you can see that then the levels of both those biomarkers started rising. And I can tell you again, it, you know, her, her decision to take the drug was not based just on the CT DNA, but it really was also based on some other clinical findings. As you can see, her ascites was decreasing, her CT, um, her abdomen showed no change. And so, again, I asked the question, what if was because... If this were a test where we could feel more confident and it wasn't just relegated to the research laboratory, we think we could have actually guided the patient better, and we think we could have offered her more hope and really a better way to track her disease status. And so, in summary, what I'd really like to show again in gynecologic cancers where we think there are really two critical decision points, and I've circled those with these uh, kind of green circles, at the time of surgery and chemotherapy, again, if we can understand better who may have improved survival, who may have worse survival, again, we can change treatment options. And it doesn't always mean being more aggressive. It can be even being less aggressive. And during that period of surveillance, can we offer our patients maybe a finer understanding of the chemotherapy response that they're having? Can we direct them to clinical trials? And again, the, the goal here is really to do better by our patients, to give them improved survival and give them improved quality of life. 
And so with that, I'd really like to thank the patients and their families that participate in this research. In particular, I also want to thank Peter Dettino, who's the co-director of uh, the uh, research facility that we've established here and director of gynecologic oncology here at Mount Sinai. Um, with that, Jeff, I'd like to turn it over back to you. Thanks, Dr. Martin Eddy. Uh, it was a great presentation to kick off our webinar. I think you showed the audience the importance of liquid biopsies in the detection of gyne gynecological cancers and how they can have a positive influence on patient care. So we thank you for that. Uh, before we move on to Dr. Wong's presentation, I want to remind everyone once again to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, simply type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom left-hand side of the presentation screen and hit submit. So let's start our final presentation. Dr. Wong, the floor is yours. The floor is yours. Thank you for the opportunity for, for me to, um, to share with you today uh, our research on this rapidly emerging landscape of liquid biopsy. Um, what I like to do is to bring um, to, to the field here uh, a non-PCR-based te technology and electrochemical-based uh, platform that can detect circulating um, tumor DNA um, that, uh, that could deliver the sensitivity and performance that fulfill the translational and clinical goals of, uh, of liquid biopsy. So um, I'm going to my second slide here is, is a disclosure slide. Um, all right. And so um, where we came from in terms of this entry into this field here was a, a, a portfolio of, of research that was supported by one of the 27 institutes at the NIH, the Dental and Craniofacial Institute, about 12 years ago in, invested in the scientific landscape of, of credentialing oral fluid for translational and clinical applications. Um, his, his journey has, has empowered the ability and credential, the use of oral fluid saliva for disease detection as well as for, for normal health surveillance. And his journey also encompassed the development of a number of tools and capabilities the, the endowment of omics information uh, that, is, that is present in, in, in body fluid and, and tissues are equally you know, present in, in saliva. So the development of the salary proteome, the extracellular RNA transcriptome, uh, the, the metabolome, and also the presence of over 1,000 microbial species that co-inhabit our oral cavity has been deciphered. And we term it saliva omics and it's cataloged and assembled into a website that uh, that we can we can all share um, the 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 essence of, of of our development into into this this emerging field of liquid biopsy as as, as we know it uh, as, as sort of summarized in the following slide here is 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 is, is a series of experiments that led to the 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 defining that that this a, a electrochemical uh, uh, platform technology, which is shown on the next slide here, where we acronym it as EFIRM, Electric Field Induced Release and Measurement, have that, that capability, that performance, uh, the sensitivity that, that fulfill the translational goal of liquid biopsy. I'll go over the schematics of the, of the scientific foundation of, of this technology, where you envision a a, a, a droplet of uh, a drop of biofluid, be it plasma on saliva, where the circulating tumor uh, uh, DNA, that is signature or fingerprint of the parental tumor, especially those actionable mutations, are embedded within these extra, extracellular extravesicular vesicles, uh, be it the exosomes or other vesicular bodies, are are are, are released into into the milieu using a, a rapidly pulsating electric field. And what you see is those sequences that harbors those mutations are released and are then rapidly detected in a, in a, in a high throughput or point of care setting using nucleic acid probes that could target those mutations. It could be point mutation, it could be deletions, it could be rearrangement, and, and the process of detection is, is based fundamentally on the principle of molecular hybridization, except it's miniaturized and, and the rapidity of the process 
is a fraction of of of, of typical uh, uh, hybridization based uh, uh, mechanism. So within within minutes, we have the ability to attract those molecular targets to a electrical service where a capture probe that could that could very pinpoint the the mutations uh, that 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 that, are, that is to be to be to be interrogated, and then through a enzymatic reaction will lead to a rapid redox reaction that allows a very sensitive readout of the presence or absence of of that of that mutations. So so using this as a as a as as a tool, um, we put to test of is. Of his performance in in two blinded clinical studies, they are pilot in nature, and 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 and, and currently is being being definitively validated. But these two pilot studies were blinded, and is coordinated by our colleagues at, at MD Anderson uh, in terms of sample randomization and blinding. The first study we 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 we, we did was in in and in, in in the country of Taiwan, and as you may know, that our our indication is non-small cell lung carcinoma, which which is well known for the presence of these tyrosine kinase inhibitor sensitizing mutations in uh, in in the epidermal olfactory receptor gene. And 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 of interest is is that in Western country the 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 percent of of patient uh, with non-small cell lung carcinoma with this mutation is 20 percent, whereas in Asia is two to three times that frequency. So. So we took it to 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 the country of, of Taiwan, where we work with a group at the National University, and this is so shown on the next slide here, and and I click forward as well, where we where we have you know a a, a cohort of 44 subjects with non-small cell lung carcinoma. They were genotyped, tissue-based genotype locally uh, for exon 19 and as well as the A58. Uh, mutations. The samples were were forwarded to us here at University of California, Los Angeles, uh, in December of 2013, and and our engineer ran the EFRM assay on these uh, blinded randomized samples. And what we see here is that performance of that first pilot study for both the the detection of the exon 19 deletion and also the 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 L858R. Mutation, the performance were were very encouraging. Uh, the area and the curve there, and and fully cognizant that uh, uh, this is a pilot study. So so that body of work um, uh, again, this was um, this this performance was was uh, was uh, was was revealed or indicated in both the plasma as well as in oral fluid saliva sample collected from these patients. So so this body of work was was published about a year ago. And and then since then we conducted a second independent uh, study. Uh, this time we took it from from Taiwan to to mainland China to the province of Sichuan to the Sichuan Lung Cancer Institute, again where the frequency of 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 of, of these uh, TKI sensitizing mutations are are very high in, in non small cell lung carcinoma patients. We had a cohort of 67 subjects. And, and and the outcome of, of of the study is shown on the following two slides here. Oh, I advanced myself a bit too fast. The the value of this study, in addition to what we did in in the country of Taiwan, is that we obtain not only post biopsy or post bronchoscopy, you know, plasma and saliva samples, pre pre biopsy samples were obtained prior to. The, the 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 pathological you know you know outcome of of evaluation of these patients because if the if the if the information the circulating tumor signatures were 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 identifiable and are valued in the in a in a in a prospective setting the ability for 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 um, uh, for early detection and perhaps early onset of the sensitizing mutations, or in these patients, as as you well know, uh, they they have acquired mutations that invariably develop in a high percentage of these individuals for all your monitoring is is of clinical value. So what we see here in this slide you know, are the plasma data for from this cohort of three hospitals that are that are that are in 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 mainland China. Looking at plasma pre-biopsy, uh, pre-surgery and post-surgery samples, and what we see here are the performance of 
detecting both exon 19 and also the L858R mutations uh, in, a, in, in, the, in the plasma samples, again, revealing, you know, an you know, outcome that is very encouraging. And, and I'll, I'll go into the, the, some of the scientific rationale that, 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 that explains uh, the, the, the performance um, uh, uh, shortly. Uh, the next slide shows the, 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 the parallel data for saliva samples. And again, um, uh, this is not to advocate uh, uh, exactly saliva, but if, if, if that performance you know, carries itself through you know, in, into a, a non-invasive milieu that that each one of us produce a liter to a liter and a half on a daily basis, that three bottle of water is worth non-invasively, non-painfully, and non-embarrassingly into the oral cavity that we can harness in real time, that's, that's clinical translational value that we should be cognizant enough that, that we could be used for early detection, monitoring these, these actual mutations, and also for, for, for therapeutic e efficacy, uh, as well as recurring of diseases. So saliva performance is equally encouraging, as we see here for both exon 19 and also for A58, you know, point mutations as well. So, so this, this, this is recently emerged, and, and, and we have these two pilot studies that, that demonstrated uh, the, 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 the scientific value and, and, the, and the clinical value of, of eFirm in, in delivering that performance. And as we know, that uh, digital drop the PCR, you know, MGS clearly uh, all there, and their concordance in, in, in terms with, with tissue-based genotyping and, and, and data actually is out for non-small cell lung carcinoma um, is, is, is about 70% uh, concordance. So, so while, while this, is, this technology clearly is, 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 is in place, um, there's, there's, there's room that, to, that, that could bridge that gap that, that meet that, that, that ultimate translational goal. Now, in terms of the rationale as to why eFirm performs, um, you know, well in these, in this, in this, in this setting, um, one of the reasons that, that we have recently, uh, was able to decipher is using reference uh, circulating DNA, which is now commercially available, uh, in a, uh, and, and, and we were able to determine that as, 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 as we know that, that digital, uh, PCR can see, you know, uh, up to a, a lytic frequency of, of, uh, you know, 0.1%. You know, for for most circulating tumor DNA, that translate into in that ballpark of about ten copy number of uh, that mutated sequence in the reaction volume. What we're seeing here is that is that uh, using eFirm, we were able to detect to to single copy of of that mutated sequence in in a, in a forty microliter uh, you know sample volume. And and I'll touch on that again. That's that clearly uh, is, is another advantage of uh, of this technology. The performance is 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 equally you know uh, stellar. Um, looking at the 858 point mutation as well as as we see here you know on this line. So. So in, in summary, uh, when where, whereas we, we these two pilot studies sort of poise us towards towards a, a translational you know mat maturity, a definitive study is currently in place where we have third three hundred cases of uh, non small cell lung carcinoma. We're working with with colleagues at at uh, at NYU um, to to definitively you know validate this technology and 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 and, and doing a direct you know comparison with digital PCR. And um, so that's that's where we're aiming for uh, generating that 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 level of data. The next slide, um, you know, highlights the, uh, the 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 perhaps the performance, the the, the deliverables that this platform, uh, uh, how it could augment, uh, synergize this, this clinical uh, uh, translational maturity of liquid biopsy. The ability and prospective study demonstrate the ability for 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 early detection. Uh, performance. It's, it's, it's liquid biopsy. It's, and as, as, in, as in most biomarker field, clearly it's, it's performance driven. Um, the early data is promising and, and we look forward to a definitive study. Minimal volume, um, and, and it's non-invasive. Um, the, the work that demonstrates so far requires 40 microliters of an unprocessed sample 
be plasma or saliva and and led to those uh, the the outcome that we that, that we demonstrated um, our early work is, is is based on actionable mutations and as we well know that uh, many of these uh, uh, diseases have acquired resistant mutations that are that are almost impossible to 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 do a biopsy um, 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 and so the, the 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 better performance the capability to detect these acquired mutations for example the 790 mutations in these non-small cell patients, and now with the FDA recently approved, the, you know, uh, a disease, to, you know, 92, 97 is now is now an actionable, you know, uh, uh, that could be treated uh, as well. Personalized medicine, precision medicine, the ability to to perform these these assessment uh, in a in a patient with suspicious, you know, lung cancer or, or, or lesions at the point of care, and and a high throughput capability, the ability to 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 know now. So. So I just want to end with with a, a, a scenario that we envision how in in the near future where where saliva um, or, or, or blood in this case here a a, a, a well designed collector of saliva could be self collected and 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 then expressed into uh, collection tubes uh, could be self collectioned and then this capability uh, for 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 stabilizing you know nucleic acids and proteins. And um, I'm hoping this slide here will show up. I'm seeing kind of a mosaic. There we are. That we can collect um, uh, at the point of care, uh, self collection. Uh, the subject uh, herself or himself could express a sample into, uh, into stabilization too. I'm just going to go back to the last slide here. That um, could be uh, um, uh, stabilized for both nucleic acids and as well as protein. These technologies are currently in place, published, and scientifically, you know, you know, you know credentialed, and it's all done at ambient temperature, allowing a sample to be shipped from the point of collection to a, a, a clinical lab or at the point of care for 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 immediate assessment. So um, the capability of this of this technology is now and soon to be commercially available. Uh, we anticipate come June of this year, uh, where we, we we anticipate demonstrated in ASCO 2000, you know, 16 of a point of care you know capability. It's being shown here, as well as a high throughput platform that uh, that should be integratable into a clear environment as well. So um, the. The final slide here is really a, a clinical scenario where we see the, the current intended uh, 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 use of, of liquid biopsy is, is patient with, with suspicious lesion, a nodule on, on a CT scan, come in for bronchoscopy, and, and the tissue sample being forwarded to a molecular lab for, for, for analysis, either using the COBOS platform or, or, or some of these other commercialized um, a clear platform, and then informing the physician what we envision. In, in the near future is that capability either to be enabled at the point of care where, where, where you know, a drop of blood, plasma, or saliva could be collected, a point of care capability in the, in the physician's office and, and be able to detect these, these actionable mutations with, with the clinical performance that, 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 is, that is close to, you know, concordance with tissue-based biopsy and then informing both the clinician, the physician, and the patient for, 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 for therapeutic, you know, actions uh, of, of, of these actionable mutations. So, so on that note, I'll, I'll stop. And, um, and again, so, so the, in, in summary here is what we, what we envision is, is that if, if a patient, in this case here, with non-small cell lung carcinoma, has actionable mutations in in the parental tumor in EGFR, EFIRM liquid biopsy will detect these mutations in in either plasma or saliva, with 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 close to perfect concordancy with with tissue based genotyping, using 40 microliters of a biological sample, no processing necessary, and the ability to ask act you know, to, to to obtain this information. At, at, the, at that point of care or in a reference lab setting under, under a, a very short period of time of, of, of 10 minutes. So on that, I'll stop. Thank you. That was excellent. Thanks very much, Dr. Wang. You showed the audience a very unique and fascinating approach towards uh, disease detection and overall health monitoring. So we thank you for that. 
Uh, before we start the Q&A session, I want, to let, I want to let everyone know that this is your final chance to submit your questions for our speakers. Uh, we've gotten some really great questions already, but I'm encouraging all of you to keep them coming. All right, guys, so uh, we, let's start the live Q&A. We had a lot of uh, really great questions coming in, so we thank the audience for that. Um, our first question is going to be for uh, Dr. Martinetti. Uh, Dr. Martinetti, one of our audience members would like to know, what are the main advantages of using this technique compared with traditional techniques? Oh, thanks, Jeff. Great question. Well, you know, listen, I, I think that the key here is, and, and I think just even in the um, the title for the Gen Talk, it's, you know, we've really got to think about demonstrating advantages and disadvantages versus car current techniques. Um, you know, in our case, we tried to compare our CT DNA results to CA125 and CT scanning, and, and those are really, you know, the gold standards in this disease. Um, we already knew and already know that 20% of women do not have elevations of CA125 despite the presence of disease. So theoretically, we can follow more women. Um, in addition, what we saw, and hopefully I was able to demonstrate at least anecdotally with some of the examples shown, is that CT DNA reacts more rapidly to changes in tumor volume, let's say maybe tumor biology response to chemotherapeutic agents than CA125. And I guess finally, uh, in answering the question, what I tried to allude to is that um, with the hope of target therapeutics, the ability to measure specific tumor mutations you know, in the bloodstream as part of a liquid biopsy should really provide a way to follow tumor response in real time. Um, what I didn't touch upon is that uh, you know, ctDNA liquid biopsy offers the ability to detect tumor heterogeneity, maybe not necessarily at the time of diagnosis, but really as we think about um, following the patient in, in the long term, and as the tumor evolves over time, we should be able to detect that heterogeneity and really understand, again, you know, how is the tumor responding, how can we you know, target it better. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Marinetti. That was a great answer. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Wong. Dr. Wong, one of our audience members wants to know, why is there a need for the eFIRM technology in liquid biopsy? So This is David here. Can you hear me okay, Jeff? We can yep. hear you fine. Great. Terrific. Yep. So, so, you know, um, eFIRM really came from a background, you know, of, of – of oral fluid, you know, based detection based on these omics constituents, uh, but in a very, very serendipitous manner, has found an entry point into, into, uh, into liquid biopsy, you know, landscape, and, 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 and perhaps you know, you know, as we, as we, as we sort of look at liquid biopsy, is, is the ability to quote unquote non-invasively, you know, detect these tumor fingerprints you know, actionable or non-actionable, you know, in, in, in circulation or in body fluid, the, the, the performance, the ability to have that, that concordancy really is, is, is the holy grail. So, so, so at, at this juncture, digital PCR and GS clearly are, 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 are technology that, that deliver, you know, performance. But that, 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 that concordancy is, 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 is not... It's not, you know, uh, you know, directly reporting to to what 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 biopsy-based genotyping. eFirm has that performance. Um, this, despite I'm first to admit that these are pilot studies, but a definitive study is currently in place. And 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 as, as I as I end with 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 my talk is that if 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 someone has non-small cell lung carcinoma has these two. You know, you know, you know, uh, mutations in 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 exon 19 and and 58 um, in in either in, in plasma or or in saliva. Eform will will pick up every one of these patients. So so that there lies the the the, the performance. You, you know, uh, uh, I won't call it advantage, but but it's it's it is what it is. And and I think, you know, if if at the end of the day, if if someone wish to sort of evaluate whether they're they're nodule on a, on a, on, a, on a CT film. Whether it's is 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 is, is, is too, it's tumorigenic or not, then then I think that performance is is the ultimate criteria for 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 for, for evaluation. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks very much, Dr. Wong. 
Our next question is for Dr. Martinetti. Dr. Martinetti, we have a, a long question here, but our audience member wants to know, um, they start out by asking, identifying DNA lesions common to most ovarian cancers appears challenging. Isn't it CDKN2D, uh, WDFY2, highest, found in only 20%? What are some strategies to develop, to develop a comprehensive blood test? Uh, that's a great question, and, and I can almost hear their pain on the other end of that question box. Um, so, you know, indeed, and, and I think the question really gets to the heart of the matter for kind of separating out the, the, the two philosophies here. So, and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, if you think about how I presented our pipeline, we, we really have, you know, the tumor acquisition stage um, at the time of an initial surgery, at the time of uh, recurrence where we'll access the tumor, sequence, and look for mutations. And the reason we do that is exactly the, the question being asked in the sense that there really aren't many recurrent mutations in ovarian cancer other than P53 mutations, and there really are no true hotspots that would really cover every patient. You've really got to dig in and personalize this test um, the way we're doing it now. Um, again, what that's afforded us uh, by sequencing the tumor directly has really been to develop a personalized biomarker panel for each patient. Clearly, that's time-consuming, that's expensive. Um, the, the, the fusion that the, uh, the, questioner, uh, the question is, I guess, uh, addressing, yeah, there are a number of fusions which in the literature seem to hit the different frequencies of patients. We haven't really identified any. We've sequenced a number. We, we've looked with some other groups. We haven't found anything that's particularly outstanding for fusions. And so really trying to move away from the RNA-seq and the cost involved there and the bioinformatics, you know, we've gone to the whole exome. We've gone to panel methods. So what we're working on now, and obviously a lot of other groups are really trying to find panels. So you know, sets of genes where, again, where cumulatively, let's say, again, each gene uh, specifically may not have uh, many mutations or be mutated in many individuals. But again, if we can identify a panel of genes where cumulatively we can start picking up more patients, we think that's the way to go. And indeed, you know, in the last um, paper that we just had, you know, even using some of, let's say, like the um, uh, AmpliSeq hotspot uh, version 2 panel, we identified at least one um, mutation for about 70% of patients. Um, you can even go another route. For example, Bobby Sebra at Mount Sinai helped us design a PacBio long read sequencing panel just for P53 genes. And, and again, you should be able to pick up essentially uh, all patients with ovarian cancer. But what we're working on now with um, Boris Riva and Bobby is, is really the identification of um, cancer panels, one for ovarian and one for endometrial, which we think, again, should be able to detect the majority of, um, or really would encompass the majority of patients with ovarian or endometrial cancer. Great. Thanks very much for that answer. That was great. Uh, Dr. Wong, our next question is a very broad question, but one of our audience members wants to know, uh, is the technology available? So the technology currently, um, as, as it's being presented, is, is, an, is an academic development. Um, however, you know there is there is there is there is a, a clinical trial that's that's currently being 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 prepared and soon to be launched in March, and and and, and we have we have a partner that that will have these. These, these these prototypes and um, um, and soon to be you know available or, or that for evaluation uh, comes June of this year. Um, the uh, it will be it will be exhibited in the in the ASCO you know in a meeting in, in Chicago uh, for both a a point of care capability as well as a as a high throughput platform, Jeff. Great, thanks very much, Dr. Wong. Uh, Dr. Martinetti, another question for you. This is actually a two-part question, um, questions pertaining to ovarian cancer. Um, do you have to recognize uh, the mutant allele in the tumor first and then follow it up in the blood? Uh, is that the way you trace the ctDNA? Uh, and then the second part of that question is, and excuse me while our fire engine goes by here, uh, any study on the urinary free DNA, uh, would that be different from uh, blood CTDNA in terms of the size of the DNA 
uh, that would freely filtered uh, from the glomeruli. Right. Another great question, Jeff. And, and actually, it seems to really, really link in with the previous question. Again, um, you know, for identifying mutations, again, if one really wants to, you know, I guess, pursue personalized or precision medicine, that this really becomes, um, I guess, the epitome of that in, in the sense that one could take every tumor and really just delve in there and, and sequence by, by whatever you know, methodology one wanted to, to really, you know, identify the, the mutations that would lead to the best biomarkers. Um, again, for cost and time and efficiency, that, that may not be the best way to do it if you just take a completely agnostic approach. In other words, just whole exome sequencing. Um, you can do that, and indeed, that, that's a lot of what we've been doing. We think a, probably a, a, a different way to do this is really to learn from all that sequencing that's been going on either through TCGA or individual uh, laboratories or different um, efforts around the world um, to try putting together a better panel to really understand better that those mutations that should encapsulate um, the majority of patients and to try doing this directly from the blood. In other words, not necessarily being beholden to having that fresh frozen tumor specimen. I, you know, I think you know, we're quite lucky at Mount Sinai working with uh, Dr. Dettino and the group of surgeons there and oncologists where we have access to that tumor, but that doesn't always happen and it, it's difficult to really establish that pipeline. Again, if we can get smarter and better to just really assay the blood directly at that point of care, we think that would probably be the best way to go. Um, hopefully that answered the first part. The, with regard to the second part, it's a great question, and I, I must be honest, we have not looked at um, you know, the ctDNA or what's left of that in, uh, in the urine. I think it would be a great follow-up study to do. Uh, we haven't done it, um, but I definitely think it's something to think about and to do. Great, thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Wong, our next question is for you. Uh, they, it's a very broad question, but I think it's an important one. Um, the audience member wants to know, why is saliva of value in liquid biopsy? So, so I, I think liquid biopsy, one of the, one of the you know, um, you know, objective is to have a, have a non-invasive means to, to, to monitor and, and detect these informative circulating, you know, uh, free DNA, and and then that biofluid obviously could be could be could be could, could be could be blood, could be other bodily fluid. Um, you know, saliva has has that that has that uh, capability to it should should saliva have the capability to reflect these um, these oncogenic you know uh, mutations, and and technology deliver that performance. Then the holy grail of of diagnostic is 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 true non-invasiveness and, and saliva. As I mentioned, that each one of us produce a liter to a liter and a half on a daily basis. That's three bottle a water volume, you know, and come into our our oral cavity, you know, non-invasively, you know, non-painfully and unembarrassingly, and we can have real-time monitoring, you know, you know, on a consecutive manner. So, so it, it fulfills these, these, the, 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 you know, you know, the goal of, of liquid biopsy, and perhaps what, um, uh, you know, a corollary to uh, to the technology itself here is that these these capabilities are performance of of reflecting, you know, circulating, you know, tumor DNA is is embedded, you know, is endowed within within this this biofluid, um, you know, uh, with, with 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 equal you know, clinical performance as as we have seen at least in plasma. So, so again, it, you know, it's it's not exactly an efficacy for for saliva, but that 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 capability, um, that that clinical performance, is in the biofluid that that we all have access to, in a continuous, non-invasive uh, manner. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Wong. It's a great answer. Um, our, I think this will be our last question for Dr. Martin Yeti. Uh, our audience member first says you did a great presentation, and uh, he wants to know, uh, do you have any public info on the mutations or fusions uh, that you folks test for on the tissue versus liquid? Well, thanks for the positive feedback on that, so that, that is appreciated. 
And it, it's interesting how the questions really do come back to, you know, the mutation profile. So, you know, we, we certainly do have that information that we've used on our own patients. We have that data, and, and certainly um, someone can certainly reach out to me afterwards uh, through an email, and I can certainly share that information. Um, but it, it, again, I think it really does come down to, at least in this disease and what we've been able to see so far in, in ovarian cancer, endometrial is, is a little different, um, but in ovarian cancer, um, it, it really does have to be uh, much more tailored to each of those individuals and where we are with our understanding now. In other words, again, either the philosophy of starting with the tumor, um, uh, doing sequencing there to really go deep and understand what those mutations are and for that particular patient, or again, using that information, you know, accumulating that background information, developing the panels that, um, you know, one can lay down a set number of genes or particular areas um, and look for those mutations that should be shared between individuals. And, and I think that's probably the state of the art at this point right now. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Mar Dr. Marnetti. Um, Dr. Wong, we will have our last question of the webinar for you. Um, the question uh, asks, besides the non-small cell lung cancer, has the technology been in use or used in other actionable mutations detection? So that, that really is, is, is this excitement of, of sort of the non-small cell lung carcinoma is, is a proof of concept, perhaps, if that's a good way to put it. But clearly, the, the, the outcome and the performance um, um, you know, is, is, is supportive that, that the, 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 the continuous landscape is, is perhaps is, uh, is, is, is an encouraging one. So, so additional indications that are, that are on, you know, on our list are, are you know, PDAC, pancreatic cancer, um, um, colorectal, as well as gastric cancer. We have a strong you know, collaboration in, in Korea, uh, where we are currently developing you know, omics-based biomarkers to gastric cancer. So those are the few that are, that are in, in, the, in, the, in the immediate list, but, but uh, I, I think we all, all, all agree that um, the, the, the list is, is, is long and, 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 and a lengthy one, and, and as our signs continue to emerge, as, as genomic landscaping signatures of, of, of human cancer begin to emerge, I think the, 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 con the engagement and, um, and the convergence of, of liquid biopsy with, with, these, uh, with this informative signature is, 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 is going to be a big, very, very informative and exciting journey ahead, uh, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Dr. Wong. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. So I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar will be archived on our website for six months at www.genengnews.com. So if you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or feel free to forward the link to your friends and colleagues. We always appreciate that. I'd like to thank Dr. Martinetti and Dr. Wong again for their informative presentations, and a very special thanks to the audience for the plethora uh, of the thoughtful questions and for their attention. So hopefully we'll see you again at another Gen webinar in the near future. Goodbye for now. Thank you.